extortion. Is there anyone who has less than $500 in a bank account? Don't be ashamed, you know, you can raise a hand. Maybe you can do a collection for you, right? Small, small contribution for, for all of you. So the reality is the, uh, it's a new phenomenon. Anyone can be extorted. And you have $500? That's good, $500 on a bank account, right? Someone really wants it. And what's the beauty? Think about this. What is the beauty in a cyber extortion? Sure, hacking too, right? But how many of you do get pay in two, three days? And they really want to pay you in a fear. Did you have a client to call you and tell you, I really want to pay your invoice? Do you need any extra money? Can I pay now? <laughs> right? It doesn't happen so often. So extortion is, um, is a new era of probably change the mindset of the criminals, how they operate and how quickly they can pay. Okay? Feel free to connect us you know, on LinkedIn, uh, media. Uh, we have our team in here in the room, um, and they, they, they do more of impressive work. You know, I'm just the character to deliver the speech. Right? I feel very privileged that over the last four years of commercial business, we had four Department of Justice indictments. We were probably part of any major Department of Justice indictment. So the domain that we pointed out very early era to the Bureau was Exdetic. Maybe you never heard of, but it was one of the first exchanges that actually resold the RDP credentials for deployment of ransomware. And um, 15 law enforcement agencies work on this. There are all these signs, this, it's, the picture is cut, but you can see uh, international cooperation within Europol, Interpol, and all the agencies try to get it done, and it finally sees the domain. Then on the right side, you actually have the two Iranians, uh, Iranians that were indicted for the Samsung ransomware. That these are the hospitals that you read in the news, remember them? The hospitals that got breached, right? That they are behind it, they're called the Samson. Why that group is important? That group was the first one that didn't use a spare phishing. They used and break through the web applications. So they actually were buying these marketing leads out of the dark web, I'm gonna get into it, and they were breaking into, into the systems. Um, then one that I wanna point out that I'm really proud, but uh, it uh, turned our business into a three months hell, was a nice hash. So nice hash had the group, remember Sony? Right, what do you remember, the PlayStation or a hack? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the, the hacking group, right, the hacking group behind the Sony called Lazarus, they are also behind a large cryptocurrency, so one of the members got indicted, and uh, one of the indictment, the partial came uh, through uh, some of the work done on the cryptocurrency market. Interesting momentum. It's now estimated that Lazarus stole and converted into cash one, close to one billion of dollars. Amazing. I, I probably have charts somewhere I can show you exactly on all the exchanges Lazarus went through and basically cashed out the money. The victim here was uh, around 80 million. And the last one is, and this was a pure coincidence we had for close to, I would say two years, the nation state group called APT10. The main reason why they say that this was one of the largest APTs is that because they went for the infrastructure of the MSP providers and um, they um, compromised the providers itself. And these, you're talking the providers who are, who serve like a fortune 2000 market. Uh, and uh, they uh, had multiple access, right? So in their data center, you had multiple victims. And the nation state basically pivoted right in through the providers and then took the data out. So that's another indictment we were part of. And we actually had multiple individuals of that group that we made attribution. But as you know, in a criminal justice system, you have to right, count very, very heavily, especially if you can't seize any equipment or you can't seize those individuals. So there are two of them on the right side. All right. So, so a little bit of the agenda in here and um, some of the uh, extortion type of uh, cases and uh, matters that we've done into it. Executive officers, teenagers, sextortion, quite a bit, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, uh, payroll data. Uh, I think we've seen uh, quite a bit uh, of it. And I'm really thankful everyone in here um, in the room who uh, pivot some of the cases to us. I see here Paul Ferrillo, which is a very great attorney uh, who pivot some of the uh, business deal compromise cases. So you know, thank you all for our trust and uh, you know, we, uh, we, we try to deliver all the good work for you. Yes, I am taking questions. Yes, I am. Well, Paul, I suggest your questions take sometimes whole presentation. You know that, right? 
the problem. Here's the, here's the problem that I, I, I'm asking you to solve for many in the work in the organizations. Sure. And I sat with somebody today talking about the the ransomware attacks that were going on in Texas. Why are we five years into the ransomware plague? At least five years. And it seems like we haven't learned how to deal with ransomware attacks. How do we defend against them? And what do we do to make ourselves more secure? Because as you know, and your, your, your files indicate, we've gone from five Bitcoin, maybe 10 Bitcoin, to ransomware payments of $750,000 in the last year. Yeah. Why have things gotten so worse, and what can we do about it, Andre? Mm -hmm. So a very good question. And so I, <clears throat> I ask someone who is much brighter. You, you know, Paul, did I tell you that in a school they had a Fulbright and Halbright scholarship and only got a Halbright? Did I tell you that? <laughs> okay. So um, I think um, one of the areas, thank you, Paul. Thank you for uh, kind words, as always. So one of the, uh, I was at the crypto meeting at the Hague around two months, feel very privileged. And I was asking Europeans, like, why they don't have such a high, massive ransomware? And you know what the message was from EC3? Europol is actually paying the ransom. Now, how excited you would be if I tell you tomorrow that FBI agents are going to pay your ransom? And that's kind of like guys in Europe. It's like, you know, I have to talk to guys at Europol to get my bitcoins. I'm not really sure I really want to do that. Why don't we just take the Americans? They don't. Right? So it, it's, it's also, I'm not saying it's a, it's a blame on the government, but the piece to it is that there's not enough scary momentum, right, for these guys to do it, and you're absolutely right. Another one that I really liked that leaked around seven, eight months ago was Ars Technica article. And uh, last uh, year and a half, I see Billy in here, uh, so thank you for all the uh, great, uh, great work uh, and working with, uh, with Billy and his team. Um, what we had was, Everyone who he had actually had cyber insurance. And they knew somehow that, for example, they asked for three and a half million on a $5 million umbrella. Then another one had a 500,000 umbrella, they asked for 350. Right, so how does, like a Ryuk and BitPamer, how do they know, how do they target people they know are going to pay? And Ars Technica ran the article, and I'm not saying it's true, that some of the broker's data had been breached. And they really picked up the broker's data, they exactly know who has a cyber, what the policy is, and what you're gonna pay. All right, so I, I think the outside of the, we can blame the corporations, right? And we can blame everyone for not doing the right job, protect, detect, defend, but there are also the outside circle that I think the, the ecosystem, I think the ecosystem is all wrong between us, government, public, private, vendors, uh, every vendor right now is selling solution, including, <clears throat> uh, uh, so, sorry, I almost misspoke. Um, everyone is telling you that they help you to defeat the ransomware, right? Uh, and it's true, it's not, right? It's, it's not, it's just, and it's gonna continue. It's gonna continue, this momentum until uh, the government steps maybe, or we create a working group, basically, and fight it. Uh, another one I, that I didn't like personally was that everyone is so dishonest about this, that it's not happening to them. But you don't have like a large working group, let's say Fortune 500, like you remember the Santa Fe was creating shared assessment? You don't have a large working group and says, we're gonna stop the ransom, because we are the big guys, we have money, we have initiatives, right? And we're gonna create this working group and say, we're gonna openly say, happen to us, you know? It goes back to um, your uh, youngster era, like how many of you honestly, when you've done something really, really stupid, ran to your parents and says, mom, you're not gonna believe the stupidity I did, right? You don't. So raise your hand. Well, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, no one really wants to say it. And a lot of these things, like you, Paul, said it, it's, um, it's not a rocket science. It doesn't require NASA. And even below the half bright scholarship that I got, right, uh, you probably can solve it. But we don't. And I also, often, and you talk to boards, I know uh, Billy talks to boards, um, that the, yet cyber is scary, but every CEO tells you it's a 5% of my problem. The 95% why my business is not going to function. So I, you can have a lot of scary stories to tell me, but I have 95% pressure, peer pressure in industry. Why my business, because of marketing, sales team. <clears throat> I tell you, I mean, Steve, every time Steve, I see him, I'm thinking, 
he, does, he, does he want more money for a sales team? Or is it a good day he's telling me to be close another deal? Yeah. Right? right? That's not true anymore. Not anymore? After Marriott and after British Airways and after Capital One, people are getting sued. Yeah, though I agree with you. At least, at least something happening, right? You know, uh, we're, we're in an industry, and I'm part of it, so I don't, I'm not proud of it, that waits for something bad to happen. It waits for people to die for us to take action and do something. Might be it. Well, Might be it. I think people are people. Are, we're seeing we're seeing SEC investigations, like into First American Title. We're seeing stuff we haven't seen for 15 or 20 years post Sarbanes Oxley because of cyber attacks. You just can't say I'm not a target. This isn't going to happen to me. It's going to happen to everyone. Yeah. yeah. No, it's definitely one of their life certainties, right? Yeah, no, but thank you. Thank you for Paul. Is there anything you want me to talk about during your panel? Because I'm happy to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you. <laughs> okay, I'll get you. Get you as up. But thank you. Thank you for your input. So the, uh, I, I, li I like the one of the groups in the early era of ransomware. And what we had was this group that um, actually a survey at the end, right? And it's kind of interesting, right? From a victim, you become a client. And then you do a survey how well you received that service from them, right? Did data get encrypted well, right? Did you decrypt it well? Did you get everything back? Right? So the, uh, the, um, the threat actors do have some um, understanding of the quality of the service they need to provide it to you. The one interesting component is that you need to understand that the bad guys are not in here to create enterprise software, right? So that, whatever they give you, that executable, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So we had multiple instances where the program did not decrypt it well. Let me give you a, a very quick example. You have a file share on a computer that's being mapped to a share of documents, and that server get also encrypted. So in the middle of encrypting one and the other, they both get encrypted by the same malware. Right? Issue, issue. Because now we have to either determine the order, or was it partially encrypted, but the other one picked it up and killed it, right? So it, it, is, it is sometimes challenging, and it's, especially on the shares, it's much harder to, to do that. Just very quickly. follow-up question to him. Um, if you have seen that the ransomware has gotten more, or the, the actual mechanisms in the ransomware have gotten more sophisticated in those past five years, or actually not, because I attended a, a talk at Black Hat where uh, there was a reverse engineering of some ransomware, and they found out that it really had just a scare factor. Like if you would run the ransomware again on the de encrypted data, you would actually decrypt it because it was just a simple XOR cipher. So it would restore the original data by running the ransomware again. And the client, of course, or the business didn't know that, so they were found you know, uh, in a bind. But uh, the ransomware itself wasn't very sophisticated. So the, let's go back to, the, to what the ransomware actually does on computer. Ransomware is a good thing because it encrypts your data. Isn't encryption good for your data? <laughs> it protects your data. So not even, not, forget about Paul, Paul, your lawyer. Including yourself. So even Paul, who's a lawyer, right? If he writes a subpoena and tells you, provide me the data, you can. So Paul, I, you know, I'm really sorry, but here is the data, it's encrypted. I, can, I, I even can't encrypt the data. Right? So it uses all the functions that are really good for the system, and we build these libraries on all the systems to support it. So now what you see is actually ransomware is ex executable are really small because they encrypt. The, what's really evil is the fact when the threat actor gets into your system. Like when you look at a bit payment, right? They focus on the Mac computers, pivot from a Mac to the Windows, maybe uh, deploy like a dry deck, some kind of bot into it. Or you see like a RDP connections, like literally just like XDedich, RDP in, brute force credentials, NSA, elevator, go up, escalator privilege, Mimikatz, Right? Pivot in some SQL credentials and spread through the network. Right? But they, when they deploy that program, that program actually what it does is encrypts your data. Now most of the programs detected behavior that that function call has been called so many times, 1,000 times or 300 times. Another fact is that a search for a DOC, PowerPoint, uh, Excel documents actually being called and then those are documents being encrypted. So most of the programs actually detect the behavior, not the encryption itself. Because encryption is native. You might have a file system that's encrypted. So that executable is now distinguished from the previous one that we've seen before. Another one, if you look at the Ryuk type of executable, they embed the root certificate in the executable itself. So the keys now are derivation for each system, but they have the root certificate inside of the executable. 
It used to be that you had like what they call XML files with the uh, uh, public keys, and then they extracted the private keys from the system. Now they generate that everything as a one batch. So I think the executables got more sophisticated. The encryption that they use, it's not really breakable. Um, some of them may be like a primitive ones like you mentioned, right? They, they, they might exist. But most of the threat actors is so simple just to download good encryption program and leverage the functions of the system that most likely you're not gonna break anything out of the encryption. It's asymmetric, fully asymmetric, and you're not gonna get anything uh, out of it. Now, where you get a lock, uh, we work on uh, the case, one of the cases, it was a RIOC maybe three months ago. And when um, one of the engineers compared the hash with the virus total and uh, mal WR sandbox, we found that executable already being uploaded. And then we ran through it, and we found that that weekend, it was Memorial Weekend when Steve called me, uh, and it was like a 2 a.m. hack of one of the medical practices. Uh, we found that like around 30 to 40 victims were swiped. All of them basically received the same poison. So if those victims knew, the, if one of them basically said, I have it, that goes back to the corroboration question. If one of them said, I paid $700,000, I have executable. By the way, I extracted the root certificate. All of you can go and decrypt the data now. If, if that one person would be honest, right, then uh, all 29 could be you know, saved, and they didn't have to pay a penny to the threat actor, right? But that doesn't happen. Yes? Well, that's the Paul's question. I think if you talk to him afterwards, he's happy to take that. <laughs> After, after the session. So let me just, uh, another one that I want to point out here is, and um, you know, in, in the OCR rules and various ones, is it incident or just ransomware? So four years ago, we had a very prestige medical society here in New York, not gonna mention exactly which one in medical field, and uh, we've got the server, and they asked us to analyze, because it got encrypted by ransomware. They had 24, 24, 26, don't remember exactly, between 20 to 30 intrusions prior to deploying ransomware. And they want us to know, and then they were asking us, so which one is that that the, you know, put the ransomware in? But they said, forget about that. Look at this, all these socials, contributions, statements that were generated to all these prestigious families, all these doctors, right? And who has the data? It was almost impossible to figure out who really has from all these threat actors data. So one of it is that when you see those RDP connections coming in, is most likely someone maybe already been on a system. And I think that's why maybe one of the reasons OCR is looking at is and saying that maybe the ransomware is the last thing they deployed. Because what happens when you have a ransomware? What happens? What IT department actually does? They scrape the system. They reinstall the system. They have no forensic to do on a system. Right, so for a Samsung that I showed you before, from the 300 or 400 servers, we hardly got 15 copies that we could forensically analyze, right? And we were able to do the indictment, but still it was, a, it, it was a challenging mission because what happened was IT scraped all the systems before we came in, right? Because of course they don't want, who wants to keep the ransom on a system? No one. And they can scrape the system, they can decommission, they, they will do it. Yeah, you had a? So when they had the legal violations, were they aware of them? Did they put a ransomware on the system? Were they aware of the other system? It's very hard to say, and I'll show you one, um, uh, something at the end uh, around that. Okay, um, I like this slide. Um, who wouldn't like the Da Vinci, right? The code. Um, and one of the Vietnamese individuals around four years, maybe not even five years back, he was 17 years old, and we had an interaction with him over the chat, and we knew we were not gonna get him, and he was, individuals who was deploying the ransom. And he basically told us on the chat that you are only good as your code. And then we wanted to know what code he meant. But what he really meant was that you're only good as your DNA code. Like your life execution in his mind was your DNA code, how good you are. And he also implied to that 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 DNA code in that software engineer actually defines the software that engineer created. And because humans and our DNA uh, has flaws, therefore security software and any software we create has to have a flaws and he's gonna be deploying the ransom. So it's all about the code. I think I should end here, right? It's all about the code, break the code. All right. This is what I mentioned about the Samsung. So Samsung originally when they came in, and why is it important in 2016? Because they said it's not the best to do the spare phishing. Why don't we look at first on anything that runs Java? Why Java? Java is platform independent. It runs on Linux, Mac, Windows. 
The promise of the Java is that create a obfuscation layer on the web servers that you can get to any underlying request, regardless of the operating system. Great promise, great promise. Great hacking in. So there's a framework called JBoss. So they look around the JBoss, the framework itself, that's being deployed on all these systems, and they figure they can drop any type of a web shell, like the remote connection back and forth into it. And they create a program, and they started deploying. So that's the, that's the origin of a Samsung. The idea is not to do a spare phishing, but to become a millionaire, instant millionaire. 70 million, I think, was estimated year one they did. Right? Massive, massive number. Just breaking into web applications. Very different momentum from the spare phishing. And that, I think that started the entrepreneurial spirit in ransomware that, hey, if you want to really do this, you're going to have a strategy, right? How you go about this. The city of Atlanta, you know, uh, came into them. So this is very good, very well organized and, uh, you know, prestigious group into it. This is the deployment, how they do it, right? So they literally pen test. But this piece is outsourced now. The pen test and an attack is outsourced. They buy this data. And the web shell that we've seen, for example, on those original victims was deployed three months prior to the company got actually um, encrypted and ransomware deployed. Meaning that the marketing team, wherever they, buy, they were buying the leads from, line up the victims for them and told them, hey, here's a list of victims that you have ready for each that marketing lead. We agreed you're going to pay us, I don't know, $200. And uh, web shell is deployed. Here's the username and password. Go and test it. You want to deploy ransomware? Go. And then they went back and they looked, looked into it, looked, you know, how much they can get um, and um, what would be the proper extortion for, uh, for the type of uh, entity. Uh, then um, and then um, they exploited, basically put the stolen credentials uh, into it on many instances. On many instances that we've seen is the stolen credentials basically are something that was dumped on the dark web and they basically just found and they were able to brute force the administrator because he had enough credentials. So for example, I have, my application has close to 5,000 passwords. And I think last time I checked the statistics on that app, it says over 500 websites that I'm part of has been compromised. But the, that app actually generates the password for me, right? So these are random. But imagine if I had to put 500 passwords by myself, there's nice prediction probably in my pattern, right? Because my passwords are very sophisticated. For example, I don't put one, two, three, four, five, six. I put a Q at the beginning, right? And it's very sophisticated. So you couldn't predict that, that very well. Uh, then they, uh, the, the, the credentials, if they have them, right, they use them basically to sign right into it. Some of them credential the JPAS, believe it or not, because the deployment of the patches on that system basically removes the security layer, and some of the patches require you to go and reconfigure the JBoss. So some of the admins just basically rebooting the system, actually enter back some of the credentials they disabled before, and now those credentials are were available, and the threat actor basically could um, uh, get into and gain access to the system. Very classical deployment with the, with the tools, deleting the shadows, install the Trojan, ransom, and basically spread it, right? That's, that's, a, that's a pace. I like this project, and you maybe never heard of, and I feel very privileged, we tried to find this paranoid individual who created this. We actually tracked him in a country in Switzerland, and we found that he's a part of the Swiss CERT, and he's a, he has a top security clearance, and we've got actually a phone call with him, and we asked him why he stopped doing this. It was a really great project, and what he was doing is he created by himself and he's around 24, 25. He asked him, we ran another event called Qubit Conference in the Prague. We wanted to speak. Beautiful mind. Beautiful mind. By himself, he created a network of 10,000 computers. This 24, 25 years individual. He created agreements with close to 60 vendors in the cybersecurity space, primarily the malware vendors. He was getting the executables and he created full automation, like detonated automations and all these IOCs. We were using those IOCs very heavily at the early era of ransomware. I wish he continued into it. As you can see, he has, if it's a domain uh, register, you had a host, if it's a malware, right? And he has here what that is. It's, it's, a, it's a C2C communication, it's a payment site, it's a distribution site, right? He made a good classification into, uh, into it. Unfortunately, the project died. He decided not to do it uh, into it. Continue. We often ask like, how expensive that is. Um, and I want to tell you, how many of you would like to digitally die tomorrow? You guys don't? No excitement? 
Come on, it's not a physical, right? It's just going to be digitally dead. It's kind of okay, no? Because you can be born again next day, right? You just copy yourself, no? Online, like you copy the profile and it's, it, it works, right? So the reality is that you know, for close to $300, like probably the lowest, lowest digital debt is $300, right? It wouldn't be for someone like a Paul. Uh, it probably would be uh, maybe a few zeros into it. Uh, but the uh, re reality is that you know, it, they, they measure. And if they want to hack you, they're going to get you. It's how many of you have seen the US sniper unit coin? Have you seen it? And the first uh, uh, section of the coin has, you can run. You will just die tired. Called the discipline of finishing, right? So the same here with the ransomware guys, right? When they order, the order is order. It's being processed, right? They're gonna get you. It's it's unfortunate, but you know it, it is what it is. But this will give you some kind of idea on the on the pricing, what that actually is. Okay, I want to get into this one uh, because in New York, I'm gonna let you know there are over 300 registered cases of sex extortions. They come a lot from these all kinds of dating sites, right? Uh, and these are actually all that are in the public news. There are some indictments here into it. We had multiple CEOs uh, being extorted. And uh, it's the same, same schema, right? In, they go after insurance, they publicity, and whatever, right? So it's becoming uh, part of the game on, on the internet, right? So another, another type of the extortion. Right? Now, even better than this is this email. And the main reason why I want to show this is how many of you are familiar with the Nigerian princess? Many, right? And you guys don't believe that anymore, right? Don't. So this email, when it came up first time that you're watching the camera and this, uh, I think maybe Steve was already around. We had two phone calls coming to the office that week, uh, right, right when it came out. And one, you, I think we were around, right? And one of the individuals says, if that's the only thing I've done, that's fine. <laughs> Right, can you check my computer? They really didn't access my computer. Uh, that was funny, funny phone call. But the reality on this was that when they get that email out, basically they know something about you. It was just a dump from the site. They knew your username and password from all these public dumps. For example, havebeenpound.com, if you go and you check your email. And they just told you that, I know your email, I know your password. So our website actually lists all the wallets that we were able to aggregate in a few days for New York metro area. Just for New York metro, maybe a little bit of the Connecticut, a little bit of New Jersey, a little bit of Pennsylvania. Uh, we came up with a $300,000 paid in first week. You wouldn't think that someone really goes for Nigerian princess, right? And that's just the area that we kind of could scoop. And we actually listed all the Bitcoin wallets so you can cross check it. It's not a nonsense, right? It just, what we kind of quickly attributed, because I said, no one's going to pay for this, right? No one is that silly. No. It's like, just we very quickly attributed $300,000 in first week. How have combo lists and data breach aggregations changed the kind of value proposition for criminals trying to do this? What do you mean? Can you explain, please, one more time? So, in other words, instead of taking 10 disparate data breaches, someone aggregates them into an easy to access file, and these become, instead of being on a single data breach, mm -hmm. you can span it across, you know, I think there was one list that had over a billion credentials. Yeah, there's also on the Torrent network, and there was a for the download, right? Um, definitely, but I would say that once those lists are public, you most of the, like we downloaded some of it for penetration testing. So our red team likes to download the list because of the passwords, right? And they want to see the frequency and they also want to get, for example, if you have the password, they also have the salted hashes that are really hard to break, right? They like to collect those for that reason. So they, they like the data breach list if the database had some password and the salt were specific to it. So they, they like that. But the, for sure, but I, I would say that uh, anyone who just goes probably quickly through some of the dumps can create this because there is millions and millions of individuals. I think what's more interesting here is that those emails were profiled, meaning they didn't do millions of millions of people based on a list like, like a single dump. But how did they really profile those individuals through some kind of API to measure the validity of those individuals that they do have some money? Right? It's almost like you can, when you go to the store and you swipe your card, so one of the Samsung victims was this company that uh, is in the space of um, uh, uh, consumer service, and they determine how old are you and what are your, what are your buying habits. And that was one of, our, one of the victims. So they 
for example, at 40 years old, you buy this toothpaste, toothpaste uh, uh, toothbrush. Uh, this is the water that you're buying. What, what are your really buying habits? So this was really profiled. And the Bitcoin wallets, if you look into them, were really just for that specific email. So they use API as a derivation to basically generate just for those specific emails. So I think that was actually more interesting than just to, than just a pure dump. Um, this one was kind of interesting. So this is the first example of the franchise. So she is, um, I think she was Brazilian or Colombian, and her video was recorded by some um, uh, threat actors. And she's been converted to 40 languages. She might still be on a Facebook, I don't know, but she's been on a Facebook for a year and a half, and Facebook didn't take her out. Even a lot of the complaints came in. And she basically lured uh, executives, primal executives, to um, do some form of a dances for her while she was doing some of the dances. She's got some qualities. Uh, convince, you know, she, she can convince people to do things for her. And some people did things for her. And then she recorded them. And then she posted them back on the internet and uh, claimed them to be uh, sexual predators and all kinds. Uh, not really good, right, on YouTube, be on a YouTube channel in that shape of a form. And then she asked for money. So, but she is a true franchise. She's been converted like to uh, close to like 40 languages. This is the, uh, where I think it's become very serious. And maybe you, ne you haven't seen this. This is uh, kind of all from 2014. But I, I, I saw this maybe like in 2015 or 2016, first time. And I never realized that the major, the, the most exploited population, we talk about a ransomware businesses, the most exploited population actually for the Asian market are teenagers. And uh, teenagers, for the reasons that they don't tell the parents, and it's so easy to squeeze the credit card. And there are a few instances where, um, I think there was a British teenager that committed suicide, and she was on a seven or eight credit card of her mom. And they were showing, the Interpol was showing the one of the units in the Philippines uh, how 30 or 40 people basically went after the teenagers, and they really profiled these kids between 15 to 21. And uh, you know, they get them into some stage where they have to cooperate. They do something really silly, and then they're pulling money from the parents, right? So it, it, it's not a large in terms of payments, but it's a great recurring business for the criminals, right? And creates a lot of psychological pressure on those kids to basically make these uh, um, uh, payments. So uh, if you uh, Google this, they literally show. And one of the individuals from that rank basically says that, so they're asking him, he was, um, he was the behind that dead of that uh, British teenager, and basically said, they're not people to me. Right, like cold-blooded, basically. He was 19 years old, said, these are not people to me, you know? They conducted most of the evil on the planet, and I don't really care, right? And basically, he was the one who recorded the messages, drop that or make a payment, drop that or make a payment. So it, it can get serious. All right, other extortions. All right, um, quite a bit you can find on LinkedIn. But on a LinkedIn, the way it works is, um, this is the profile that, for example, I've got, is uh, LinkedIn had an API, and it was available for some point of a time, that basically made an attribution, who, is, who are you the most connected on the network? And your right page, if you didn't have like, a really effective number, actually pinpointed. So for example, me and Steve writing messages every day, that API would rank those individuals that I'm the closest with into it. And what you could do then is actually write and phishing emails like from me between those two and get them, right? Not really got to me because you already have my profile, right? You're already connected to me. But, but now you can actually tailor the conversations if someone is really active on the social media. So really, really good tool. LinkedIn abolish a little bit of the, of the model. That's my understanding. Uh, another way is to do the way our marketing guy four years ago did it for me. He connected me to 5,000 people, so it becomes obsolete. And now my profile has 24,000 people. Uh, so you can't really do this. It doesn't work. The algorithm is so thrown out of the window with the 24,000 people that it you know, just can, can accumulate on the right side. Who should be on the right side, right? Because just window is not big enough to, um, to do that. This is the ad that, that I mentioned before, uh, the, how they look like uh, into it. And this is the schema, how it works. So originally when they started, they had like the 70,000 hacked servers, uh, various RDPs. The, allegedly the server here in, uh, for the big four, if you recall, it was a hack into the big four, into the exchange environment, and they had a credentials that it came in through the RDP, was on this website for half a million dollars. It was the highest, uh, one of the highest uh, uh, prices for the RDP type of a server 
that was uh, sold on uh, Xterich. And uh, it's basically, was a, for many years, this was a marketing tool for ransomware. So basically, even we had uh, one of the departments in the city here that Steve and I was involved in a city that uh, does the cleaning here, called us on Friday that on Saturday the trucks are not going to run. Uh, remember the Italians, like when they had the garbage in the streets? Um, so we had to um, do a little bit of a cleanup, but the turned to be that they were listed also on this site. They were sold basically on, on this site, on Xterich. Uh, another sign, uh, Russians was, for example, Happy Hack, right, with, with the prices. Uh, this is an example of the Xterich, for example, for data. They had also the PI for sale. Um, they also had uh, programs that you could just run and configuring the RDP. So they would reconfigure RDP for you. They would set another account for you. They would deploy executable if you wanted to into it. And these are the, the standard pricing, uh, how it looked like. So this is the interface. And you just went through it, look at IP addresses, and pretty much everything was under $10, right? Any access to any one environment was under $10. If they knew that it was something more um, luxurious, they, they sold it. But basically, like, the normal access was under $10. So that's originally how the ransomware was really distributed, just through these, these type of means, right? Before we knew the uh, cyber insurance list, right? We had to, <laughs> right? They had to go through this, but they don't have to do that anymore, I guess. All right. Someone asked about the honesty and disclosure these companies, did they know? So from an ex site, uh, you, you can't get the whole list because that's actually sub being subpoenaed by the government. But there are leaks of those lists. So one of the leaks has 100,000 IP addresses. It's converted to the 30 to maybe 40,000 businesses because some of them are repeatable in it. And if you go to our site and search for these potentially compromised IP addresses, I don't remember exactly the number, but then less than 10 businesses ever had any public disclosure that this happened to them. There are a few Ivy League universities in a city, and this is a true story. NBC calls us and wants to do a show about this university, Ivy League University in New York, who had been uh, on this list for the last two and a half years, and upon over 15 systems of that university have been exposed, including the systems that host students entering the data and payments and socials and uh, loans and everything. Then the public affair from that school called us and asked us why we dropped them on the internet. What kind of evil is that, that our website is listed them? Because if you, if you, if you just search university in here and click submit, uh, things do come up very quickly. So we, that's what we did, right? We went like, put it in the university, submit, and it's like, oh yeah, they had all these intrusions. They had all these intrusions into it. And uh, they didn't probably tell anyone that someone actually knows their RDP credentials into their system. Uh, so they, I guess they had to uh, answer to some of the regulators and figure out like, what really the remedy is going to be uh, for them. And I'm sure they've done everything well. But the point is, is, is to what you were asking, you usually can't hide it. If you get an extortion or ransomware, probability of you hiding this is probably slim. In one or two years, your IP address appears on some dump the same way the dump appears with your email and password from some kind of website, wild and cheese that got compromised. The same way the ransomware IP addresses from the breach companies do appear on the internet. So most likely if, so being hacked, it's kind of pure luck, right? Because no one knows outside of threat actor IP addresses. Having ransomware kind of equals most likely people are gonna know, your neighbor's gonna know. It's gonna leak out. In, in a half a year or in a year, and the IP address, if someone really converts it, they're gonna know, hey, they got hit by ransomware. This was the ransomware. This was the uh, uh, tool that they got. A little bit about the cryptocurrencies. The, um, one of the groups that uh, was doing the um, uh, extortion, basically related in the DDoS type of a business, and if you didn't pay the Bitcoins, then they tried to DDoS. It turns to be that they couldn't really do much of a DDoS, and they tried to do multiple ones, so they actually abolished the model. But they were really heavily into um, uh, threatening the companies to create a DDoS into, into the environment. This is one of the companies that we um, made a little bit of partnership with called Chainalysis, that do cryptocurrency and tracking into it. And what I mentioned before, the Lazarus, one billion. And uh, here's what I wanna show you, truly. And I'm not saying it's accurate, and I'm not saying it's completely trackable, but this is how much volume, annual volume is 
of Bitcoins exchange on the black market. If anyone is asking you what the Bitcoin is really used for, if you look at it in here, close to 700, what, millions? I, annual, right? So we're getting into 1 billion annual in Bitcoins that we know based on the wallets right now. Uh, yes, I'm, it's not taxable. We need your help to help to tax it because I think we can convince IRS to pay us back on 1 billion. Oh, you did? Oh, you did? <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, that will be, uh, that's, that's a very significant number, right? Very significant number. And of course, the, the trading volume and anything else outside of, the, outside of it um, is, um, is, is different. But that gives an idea, like where if someone tells you he has a lot of Bitcoins, maybe what he's really doing. So if you look in 2017, in April of 2017, uh, Bitcoin was at $1,200. And at the end of mid-May, it were rallied up to $2,200. And that was because of the uh, WannaCry virus in uh, Europe. And then if you look in October, it spiked up to 4000 That was because of Equifax dumping the data. And, then, and if you look at the end of 2017, the CME released their futures on uh, Bitcoin. So it actually was a, an indicator. The price of Bitcoin was an indicator of cyber crimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, definitely. But I will also say that they just want to get paid in Bitcoins, right? So the price, the price is great if the price fluctuates, but they want, for example, um, in some of the cases that we had like recently, and um, yeah. is that they basically told you, we want $400,000 in Bitcoins, right? And then you convert it to the Bitcoins, and then you actually pay them that in Bitcoins, right? So they have money. They have money in, uh, in the mind. Uh, this is, for example, daily activity, right? All right, so I don't want to leave you blind, right? Because everyone always says that I have these scary stories. So I have a couple of few slides, a few suggestions for you, right? What to do. So what do you do if you are hacked? Uh, if your company is hacked, like how would you remit a situation? And uh, what tools do you use for the cyber risk? Some of the slides um, I like to repeat. So uh, if you uh, already have seen them, fine. If not, uh, it's okay. Uh, I like this slide, right? And how do you know you've been hacked, right? Um, so going to my point with this slide is there was a company um, in a uh, government entity ran in Iran, and the threat actor was so desperate to tell them they've been hacked, so they started rebooting their computers. They were um, performing all kinds of actions on the computers, but not, none of it was too obvious to them they've been hacked. So they decided to play ACDC Thunderstrike on the computers. So my point to you is that when your computer is playing music on its own, it's time to wake up, okay? It's, it's you really been hacked, right? It's not just rebooting itself four times a day, right? you really been hacked. You have to pay attention to this. Um, but also the point is that the, uh, each of us has so many tools, so many different things, and everyone tells you why it would not happen to them. Right? The, can you avoid cold? Can you not get a cold? Right? You're going to get it. You're going to have something. So we live in an era where you get a cyber sickness. You just don't know if it's going to be cyber cold to cyber cancer. You just don't know. You don't know what you're gonna get, right? And the fact that you, th that companies thinking, no, it's not gonna happen to us, it's, you're gonna get it. You just don't know what you're gonna get. And when, of course you don't know when, but it's, I would say, now it's a life certainty that your data in between, you are here, and your molecules disappearing in the universe, are going to be breached. You can be positive about it, it's like 100%. It's like one of life certainties. You know, on, a, on your board certificate, it should be like data breach record, <laughs> right? Maybe, right? New, new category. So what you should really do, right, when you are hacked? I like this slide, right? Um, and main reason for this is, imagine your relative is in the emergency room and they're doing, performing some kind of surgery to him. Are you allowed to, every 20 minutes, to enter the operating room and ask, hey, how is he doing? What is really happening to him? No, you're in the hallway, right? Somehow when we're doing these cyber investigations, and attorneys can tell you, every half an hour they call you, what is happening? Where we are? What is this? Where we are, right? Everyone is so impatient. By the way, everyone knows better what your job is. Everyone can critique your job, right? It's almost like a Superman, everyone is flying, and I told you, I told you, I told you so. So many times we talk about this, never happened. Remember these passwords? None of it is relevant at that point. This is the period when you really need to become, and uh, yes, we had a great run, all of us, right, in a job. 
So let's keep it that way. Uh, when you update your resume, I'm sure you can find another job. Um, but the momentum that we created in this industry is that everyone understands everything. It's not really good, not healthy for, for, uh, for conducting this type of forensic work on investigations, because we actually don't. And I tell you, I don't know much. And I always learn from people like Billy, Paul, and everyone. I don't, I don't listen to them, right? I'm always listening to them. Because you can't be expert in everything. It just doesn't exist, right? And the same for the executives, for the companies. You need to have a patience. Like, things did happen for a reason, right? And it's a normal process. It's, if someone was hacking you for a month, why do you think the forensic company can do this in three days? Really, is that what the SOW is, for three days? Right, then maybe I need to update my resume and look for that business who can do something in a three days. It's not gonna happen in three days, right? When you have a surgery at a hospital, what happens? Right? They're gonna patch up your knee in the emergency room, then you're gonna go to the hospital and you're gonna go to rehab. How many years? Two? When you start really running well? Year and a half? Maybe. So why do we think in cyber you can do everything like in split of a second? Because this technology is just digital, and that's, this is the misconception that it's much harder to overcome with executives and explain them that, no, you can invest it into this, but you know, to do this right, this is a process. It takes time. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It will not happen tomorrow. And we can create a not beautiful SOWs for you, but it's going to take a time to address it. The third one important is how to remediate is that every company has a culture. And to every company that you come in, it's what they call the, like a tribal leadership or, you know, you know, when they do these experiments, like the guy dancing around the fire and then everyone is dancing and you ask them why are you dancing, they said, well, because he's dancing, right? And no one really knows what the dance is about, but that everyone just mimics that dance and that dance is a culture of that company, the signature of it, right? Uh, so every company has it. Every government has it. Every organization has it. And you can't really be, you can't be really judgmental uh, into the organizations just because they have that type of culture. You need to be understanding of that culture and have the reasoning, okay, so it happened to them, they're a victim, now how can you help them? And I remember on my old era, when I started at the mathematical physics department, one of the scriptum had a text, when a conversation between son and father, and father was telling to his son, son, people who can't explain them correctly to you and you don't understand them are idiots. Do you understand me? No, that. So you don't want to be in that position when you can't explain yourself to the clients. I know that it's always challenging, right, to work with the clients. It is, because guess what? They still don't understand. But it's just the momentum, like the level of understanding in, a, in, in the tribal and a culture is very important. What do you should do? Follow the NIST, respond, protect, detect, and analyze, right? The point of this is that it's a process. You can't buy a cyber pill. By the way, we tried to create a cyber pill, didn't work. We didn't get FDA approval. So you will have to follow the process. There's no cyber pill. But we have a pill that when you take it, you feel well. And you don't care about anything. So if you want that, that's actually legal. So you can just take the pill and you feel well. You know, nothing is bothering you. The, the world is green and you're cyber secure, right? So those pills actually do exist. They're a little bit for different type of um, uh, environment. But truly, you have to protect the tech analyze, right? So conduct some type of assessments, the audits where you are at a snapshot of the time. Create visibility at your organization through the detection meaning into it. Um, and analyze, right? Always question what you have. So advisory training, awareness into it. And when response is just natural life cycle, it's not, you shouldn't be looking at when everything fails. No, you're going to get cold. This is natural part of that cycle, is to, you do need to respond issues and challenges that you have as a business, right? You shouldn't be looking at it, oh, everything failed. No, it's just gonna happen. Tomorrow, if the military units start shooting rockets on your house and you will call your police station, what are they going to tell you? Uh, then I, they can't help you, right? So there are forces on the planet that you can sustain the pressure from, even as an enterprise. Keep that in mind, right? So it's not that everything failed. No, your adversary is uh, better than you are. It's so like a boxing match. You lost the boxing match. You sit. Few of the links for um, the uh, resources that we have in here, okay? And a uh, few of the uh, points. What I want to I want to make is that we live in an era where zero trust is something that you do need to inherit into, right? 
Like, I look at the mirror in the morning and I don't trust myself. You guys at level of paranoia? Not yet. Right? So some level of paranoia is needed in life, right? And some level of paranoia for business is also needed. So it's, uh, it's very important. Very important to develop relationship with the vendors and law enforcement. I like what John Felker said from a DHS. Cybersecurity is a team sport. You're not going to win if you're alone, right? This is a team sport. Right? So keep that in mind. Look at some of the complete solutions from the providers. Ask and, you know, think about this, Steve. You're only good at your code, as the people around you, your advisors, your team. Everyone has tools, right? Even military has guns, right? But if the, if the army doesn't know how to shoot properly, that gun is for nothing, okay? It's for nothing. Think of how could you explain the, uh, the low probability with the high impact to executives. And practice, training, practice, training, practice, very, very important. And you're always gonna have the unknown unknowns.